soothed by sun and surf, most visitors have no clue that Hawaii is in the midst of a bitter battle. The ugly international fight over GMOs is playing out in the islands, polarizing rural communities, influencing politics, and sowing seeds of fear. On the Big Island, vandals destroy acres of papaya trees on three farms. Agriculture has long been the foundation of human life in Hawaii since the first Polynesians arrived and began planting taro. Most of the people born in Hawaii uh, come from an agricultural background at some point in the past. Uh, most of the families here came as immigrants to work sugar fields and uh, pineapple fields. So they've got that in their past, but as the generations go by, I think there's, there's a major disconnect between what actually goes on on a farm and what the public perception of what farming is all about. That disconnect began when the pineapple and sugar plantations closed, shaking the very foundation of life in Hawaii. With hundreds of unemployed farm workers and vast tracts of land lying fallow, the state was desperate for a new crop. In response, multinational companies began expanding the seed farms they started in the islands some 50 years ago. They grow genetically engineered and hybrid parent seeds for plant breeders around the world, producing Hawaii's most valuable crop. As the islands gained international stature for seeds, mainland anti-GMO groups took notice. Infusing island activists with money, they began fanning fears around pesticides, GMO crops, and standard agricultural practices. Family farms and papaya growers are caught in the crossfire. The papaya is a staple in Hawaii. Everybody likes papaya. You know, our customers don't even differentiate <clears throat> that is it genetically modified or not, they, they want papaya. In the morning, in the retirement homes, if there's no papaya, you can bet there's gonna be forks pounding <laughs> on the table because they're like, I'm missing my papaya here. We don't even think about it. It's, it's just assumed to be there for us. This highly nutritious fruit is a staple in tropical countries around the globe, where it's valued as a tasty source of fiber and vitamins A, C, and E. The papaya is the most healthy fruit you can get, the cheapest fruit in, the, in Hawaii, and that's because it's available. It's available because scientists use genetic engineering to create papaya resistant to the deadly ring spot virus, which was destroying Hawaii crops in the 1980s and 90s. The GMO rainbow and sunup varieties help save family farms in Hawaii, but ring spot continues to be the single biggest threat to papaya production around the world. You know, I'm a second generation farmer. I, my dad was farming originally, and uh, I went to the University of Hawaii, got a degree in agriculture, and while in the military decided, you know, I don't think I want to stay 20 years in the military, so I got out and joined my parents to do farming. And of course, uh, when we first started off, it was really good. I mean, papayas were good. But uh, again, like you say, in the 90s and 80s, we had the problem with the papaya ring spot virus. When I was a kid, ring spot was always there, and it, it pretty much wasn't a big deal. If he saw it, he'd take the machete and cut it. So it never really impacted us very much. That was until later, when the virus really changed and, you know, his field became less with all the chopping of the trees. And you see the papayas all covered with ring spot and the taste wasn't good either. The ring spot virus is spread by a small aphid, which travels easily on the island's ever-present winds. As the virus infected one field after another, farmers began spraying insecticides, hoping to kill the aphids. But nothing could slow the virus' destructive advance through backyard trees and commercial orchards. You know, if you get a hurricane or a big windstorm, big uh, rainstorm, and your crop is wiped out, okay, you can get over it, replant. You know. With a ring spot, it's slow death. Okay, ring spot, you know, the virus the, spreads not quickly, but over time. And, you know, viruses don't cure itself, viruses keep going. And so eventually the virus got into my fields and I was cutting down trees every week. In about a year's time I was cutting down, I was down to about 50%. So, you know, how do you combat this thing? And, you know, I was in contact with the University of Hawaii and all these researchers. Uh, no cure. And so the only cure was move on to another virus-free area. But again, you know, viruses uh, have a way of spreading around. and Eventually, those fields got infected. It came to a point where, uh-oh, do I continue farming or do I get out? 
that, 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 that's how devastating it is. I start uh, farming, continue farming, and then the buyers come along. We cut the trees around one tree, then radius of about 30 feet we cut down because we want to stop the spreading uh, the virus. But uh, oh, getting worse and worsen. 1995, I get a chance to move over here at a uh, shipment. This is a uh, shipment uh, land. And by the time we plant about, about 70 acres, the virus wind came again. By the time we get big fruit, cut down, all ne I never harvest. All the money that I saved, then all, oh, all oh, went gone. Alberto Belmes is not alone. Farmers around the world face economic hardships when their crops fail. The tools of biotechnology offer hope for reversing these losses, so small-scale farmers can thrive. While I was at the U.S., Dr. Dennis Gonzalez was my classmate, and we were in the Aggie Club and all this kind. Of, and I was, like I say, in contact with the University of Hawaii. And, you know, there was Dr. Ferreira and Dr. Mansard and all those guys, you know, hey, we, you know, you get, just got a road. And so that's when Dennis came up with this idea of, I got the solution. One thing about the papaya story is, uh, it's a story about um, scientists being proactive. 95% of the Hawaii's papaya industry was in the Puna area, like here. But there was no virus. But the virus was in Hilo, only about 19 miles away. The dean said, you know, what would happen if the virus come into Puna? I said, oh, it'll devastate Puna. And so he asked uh, me to start doing some research. That's 1978, look way. And then so we, we uh, had an approach that we call cross protection, where you get a mild strain of the virus and, and then you inoculate papaya. And we actually tried this with Ken Kamiya. By the mid 80s, that's when the technology was developing, so you could sequence genes, you could isolate genes. There, there are the necessary biotechnology tools that agriculturists like me could employ. For many crops, you know, you can breed resistance in. You find a resistant variety and then you just cross it with uh, your commercial variety. And then you have a plant that's half you know, the genetics of the resistant variety and half the genetics of the commercial variety. And then you have to, then you got to do back crosses to the commercial variety. So it's basically a way to move a gene from A into B. This is the old way of doing it. And now with the tools of um, genetic engineering and people are now finding genes for resistance in plants and they can move them from one plant to another plant and just have it just make a plant resistant that way. It's amazing. The idea was to try to make virus resistant papaya. And the concept essentially was like vaccination. If somehow we put a small fragment of the virus into the papaya, it's going to make it resistant. Well, that's all on paper. Dr. Gonzalez cultivated his papaya seedlings in the greenhouses at Cornell University, a world away from the infected Hawaii fields. I had about six, seven lines of the transgenic plants that had the gene in it. We don't know if they're resistant and my controls. And I go and inoculate the thing with the virus. And every day I go and look, hey, nothing happened. But then usually in about 10 days, the controls start to get symptoms of the virus. Then there's one transgenic like, hey, it looks pretty good. Then three weeks later, these papaya still keep on growing. I said, oh my gosh, looks like we're resistant. And then a month later, in my estimation, this thing is resistant in a greenhouse. We really got to see if this thing works in the field and grow them in the Oahu where the virus is bad. In, in the mid-90s, the papaya industry was centered in the Big Island. They had a big industry. We were serving like, oh, we were up to almost 65 million pounds a year. And here was the virus coming in, coming in. People were cutting, cutting down, cutting down. There were farmers who didn't want to cut because you got fruit in. So quality was going down, production was going down, and all kinds of problems, and farmers were getting desperate. The virus-resistant papaya offered hope, but it couldn't be grown until the federal government said it was safe. 
so Cornell began navigating the difficult regulatory and licensing process, eventually securing federal approval and the right for local growers to manage their own seeds. Meanwhile, the virus continued its destructive march. By October 1994, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture abandoned its efforts to control the virus. Local papaya growers seemed doomed. But their despair turned to joy when the first GMO papaya seeds were distributed by lottery in a May Day celebration. May 1st, 1998, we hold a celebration at the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel and they did distribute the first transgenic papaya seeds free to the growers. And that's where Alberto Bell missed God is. Really, the story is technically is quite simple, but I think the difference between our team, it was in our heart to try to solve the problem. That's it. I'm so happy that I had that uh, rainbow papayas. Otherwise, my kids don't even finish college if I don't have that rainbow. Because that rainbow, I made my first son uh, graduated in American University. He saw the resistance, and he was among the five first adopters and planted this year. And now, at 1998, end of 1998, he's doing this. Well, now it's 2016. What else can you say? I mean, resistance is the most sustainable way to grow a crop. I was just telling my students today that the best way to manage plant disease is to, to use a resistant variety. And um, that way, the, it's built into the genetics of the plant. You just plant the crop. You don't have to spray or do anything else beyond that. And then you don't have to worry about that disease anymore if you have a good resistant variety. Using the new resistant varieties, Hawaii farmers began replanting their fields. Local consumers welcomed the tasty fruit, and Japan approved import sales in 2010. Papaya farming was peaceful and productive again. But dark clouds were already gathering on the horizon. Anti-GMO groups, funded in part by a highly politicized arm of the organic food industry, were stepping up a worldwide campaign against genetically engineered crops. Activists were ripping up fields, destroying papaya test plots in Thailand and Venezuela. Hawaii was soon embroiled in the conflict, the likes of which it had never seen. Activists began pushing legislation to halt GMO agriculture on Kauai, Maui, Molokai, and the Big Island. They relied heavily on the internet and social media to spread their divisive message of distrust, fear, and hate. So I would tell my dad, I said, Dad, I'm seeing some weird stuff on the social media. I would tell the Farm Bureau people, I'm seeing some stuff on the social media. Fear memes. GMOs are dangerous. GMOs are poisoning your children. Just just this little bubbling, I think we got to do something, you know. And old timers, they don't know what the social media is, so they're like, ah, we've had this kind of, you know, people from the community and they just make a lot of noise and, you know, they don't quiet down in a while. In, in Hawaii, okay, we, we come from oriental background, the Filipino farmers, the Japanese farmers, and South Chinese farmers. You know, we are reluctant to become outspoken and brazen and whatever you know call it so we 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 all hope that it'll pass but the way it's going on it doesn't pass it gets worse and worse so the memes kept continuing and then i started seeing more illustrations of fear mongering you know especially against the seed companies i was like mm -hmm. gmos are dangerous GMO. i said but our papaya is gmo and sure enough they came after us the anti-GMO people wanted to, de to destroy the papaya industry, which was saved by GMO. The lady that was leading that charge made it a point of going to different uh, farm communities to speak to them. One of the other farmers said to me, well, you know, she came in here and she did not listen to what we were saying. She had a point that she was trying to make she made her point and she left. So we were left in the same position. She may as well not have come because we've read that in the paper. We've heard her position already. She was not willing to talk, listen to us. Margaret Willey proposed this bill to ban transgenic crops on the Big Island. That's when I got involved in the, this conversation. 
So I went down to the county council to provide testimony. Saying, I, when I heard about it, I thought, this is crazy. There's no way <laughs> this bill is going to pass. And I went, but when I went down to the, the county council chambers for the testimony, I was amazed. And there were probably 80 people who are like anti-GMO and saying how this is gonna, this is gonna kill us. I was invited because they want, the county council said they wanted to take expert testimony. So they had a few of us from the university down there. And it was awful. It was like eight hours that day or something, maybe even longer. So they called me Steve Ferreira and Richard Manshart. There's the three of us went up and they asked us something about Roundup. And none of us were Roundup experts. So we answered as, as well as we could. And they said, thank you. Don't go away yet. So we sat down. They never called us back. And like all together that day, the people who are supporting transgenic crops or G G GMO agriculture, it was maybe 10 minutes or something, 15 minutes. And the rest of it was all this anti-GMO stuff. They Skyped in Jeffrey Smith from the mainland. In short, in other words, eating papaya that's genetically engineered might cause you to get more colds, more, more susceptibility to hepatitis or HIV. If you eat these transgenic papayas, you're more likely to get the flu, HIV, hepatitis. He said that out loud in front of the whole county council, and then that kind of stuff swayed them. You know, so then they... I actually heard like one of the county council members say, you know, I, I don't know now, because better to be safe. And I think that was so uh, dishonest and irresponsible of that guy to say those kinds of things. I mean, they got what they wanted, but they just lied to get there. We went there and we were so busy. We're supposed to do something already on the farm, but we are not like those activists that no matter you they stay all day, all day, all day, how many days? But us, we have to work, we have to work. That's why on those other uh, hearings, I could even attend because, ah, oh, I gotta come and work because we really take care of the farm. They've been doing what they do for a long time. They eat the food so they grow it safely. They've never had any complaints. They've never, you know, they're, they're proud of what they do. And to have somebody who's been here for 10 minutes walk in and tell them, you know, these guys have like, they're third generation farmers. Um, to have somebody come in who's been here for 10 minutes and tell them that they're doing it wrong doesn't fly. It just doesn't. There's a great deal of resentment here. And I would imagine the same thing would, would happen with the, with the farmers on the other islands. I think a lot of farmers are, are really disappointed at how, how they're being perceived. And it's, it's funny because a lot of the polls that have been done indicate that people really like farmers, you know. Uh, paradoxically, I, it's, it's, it's very weird in that, you know, they may like the farmers, but necess not necessarily like farms or even being next to a farm. We're your neighbors. We're out there working every day, keeping the green spaces open and keeping the fresh food coming. Um, we love Hawaii. We love being here, we love working here. This is our narrative, um, and we hope you embrace us. I strongly to continue the farming because I know that uh, rainbow papaya is, they cannot just stop because it's, it's already proven to the consumer that it's good, good papayas, good fruits. Yeah. Agriculture itself in Hawaii is you know, fairly unified. We had the Farm Bureau, we had the um, seed companies. So we were quite unified and we were afraid of, you know, some of these um, initiatives that they were pushing, especially on Kauai. And so, you know, we said, hey, we, we, we better be united in our front and our stories to make sure that uh, we don't get pushed aside. And, and sure enough, you know, he went from Kauai to Maui to the Big Island. And so the papaya farmers, you know, on Ma the Big Island, seeing their livelihood on the line, really organized. And we had a big, you know, good demonstration there to say, hey, listen, this is part of our life. This is part of the economy. It's very important and we can't lose it. You know, I would prefer just to stay on the farm and not really be, be as engaged as I am. But, um, you know, we found that, um, you know, these issues have to be addressed. And if, if we don't have a voice, if, if we don't have a voice in, in uh, political decisions, if we don't have a voice in, 
in our policy decisions, then we're not going to be able to continue farming. We talk about encouraging more farmers, but yet we don't really do the, the necessary work to get young farmers. When my son joined me in the farm and started to work and seeing the good sides of it, but then seeing this anti-activism side, it says, it'll be a strong deterrent, I think, to, for young farmers, and I, I don't think that's a good thing. I think we can deal with most of the problems we have, except those created by, by people who have an agenda that doesn't include agriculture. The nature of farming is such a, a risky undertaking that every farmer would want all the tools available to them to be successful. Uh, not just for the economic reasons of being able to support themselves and their families, but to provide food uh, for the masses, the, the people that can't grow their own food. You know, I think we're going to need all types of farming. We're gonna, we're gonna need um, um, organic farming, we're gonna need biodynamic, we're gonna need food forest, we're gonna need all of the above to make a goal. We're gonna need large farms, we're gonna need medium-sized farms, we're gonna need small farms. We're gonna need all different types of production methods to make this thing work on a global scale. It is not the case that the general public is anti-GMO. There's some people are and they're very very vocal and they make other people uncomfortable and I think uh, as opposed to when I was getting into this it was just an exciting new field and we thought that we could do so many things I, th I think now you know a young scientist would think twice about pursuing this approach to uh, improving agriculture Confronted with an anti-ag sentiment that threatened all farming in the islands, Joni started publishing her own blog, The Hawaii Farmer's Daughter. One of the reasons why I started blogging is because I felt that there was no pro-science, no story of the farmer on Hawaii's end out there. You know, my dad always taught me that if you have the knowledge and power to do something, do it. And if it will make something better, do it. So that, that gut feeling really stuck in me and I said, you know, I really should do it. I know I will face a ton of hate. I know I will get horrible hate mails and, and just really bad things said about me. But I thought, who's going to speak for the small guy? Who's going to speak for all those farmers on our islands? Who's going to speak for the ag workers who work in the seed companies who, don't, who aren't on the social media, who aren't able to speak or who, aren't, who are afraid? that fear can really make things very ugly. I had a good psychological background on how to deal with this kind of stuff. So I would have to diffuse that in my work, and I used those same strategies <laughs> online with my comments and walking people down out of this massive fear hysteria and really saying, well, really, and creating a conversation with them where they're not so hateful and not ignoring the hate, and why are you hateful? Why are you so scared? And really bringing down the emotional level of the tone. Based on that, you know, it pulled out allies. People, the, the local people would write me and say, thank you for saying that. And I'm thinking, there are people that are out there that can see this. And this is what we need for Hawaii. Agriculture is one of the most environmentally disturbing <laughs> things that you can do. Because you take a bunch of land, you clear it, you crop it for food. You know, the population's growing, there's going to be more people, there's more, more food's going to be required, and if we don't get more efficient, we're just going to have to expand the acreage that food's produced on now. And we're going to have to move into like, rainforest areas and places like this. And I think the thing to do is try to, as much as possible, increase efficiency so we can get as much food production per acre as possible. So we need technology for that to happen. I like the idea of organic farming. It's nice, it seems like a low impact way to farm, but it's less efficient. So, I mean, that's fine if you're not worried about trying to uh, minimize the footprint of agriculture on the planet. 
Kurt and Pam Hirabara are trying to encourage that sort of dialogue while leading public tours of their Waimea lettuce farm. The general public um, make an assumption that organic produce is safe. There are naturally occurring things that can be very dangerous to you know, humans and animals, but we feel it's our job to educate them. And then now, of course, the big issue is the GMO thing. And that too, I think, is uh, a lot of their questions or a lot of their attitudes, you know, have been based on misinformation or lack of information. You know, this business of GMO, anti-GMO and organic versus conventional farming, there shouldn't be a line there. I mean, uh, it's all ways of producing food, which should be, if you have a choice, do I buy this or do I buy this? Is the price higher here? Is the price lower here? You have the choice. So there shouldn't be a line where, you know, the system, the marketers, whoever, are making a line where forcing people to choose and cause divisiveness. You know, there's a lot of people out there who support us and support, you know, Hawaii going forward. Basically, biotechnology saved the papaya industry from extinction. Um, and I think going forward, we're absolutely going to have to find answers to some of these problems that we're having. Banana bunchy top virus is a severe virus of bananas. You know, we've seen decline in banana production in Hawaii. You know, at one time we were, we were more than 50 or 60 percent self-sufficient in banana production. That's no longer true because of a virus. Growing more food on less land is what's, what we're going to have to do. And biotechnology is going to help us do that. It's so complex. It's, it's so difficult. Because yes, we don't have people who understand farming. They don't understand us. We've had so much fear mongering that there's people not willing to listen to us. And some people just don't know where to go. And we gotta heal from there. You know, we, we're a nation to be linear thinkers who wanna see immediate actions, immediate solutions, without realizing the unintended consequences. And so with dialogue, discussion, and consensus building, we can avoid all these unintended consequences. I, I see there's hope, but we have to do the discussion. I can see where if somehow the, the groups, quote, groups come together and discuss this, then you can get the best of both worlds. Hawaii papayas aren't the only crop at stake. Farmers everywhere face similar challenges. The same technology that created the Sana papaya could protect cassava, a crucial African fruit crop from the mosaic virus. It could also protect citrus trees from the HLB bacteria known as citrus greening disease. Bangladeshi farmers and their families are benefiting from a pest-resistant variety of brinjal, or eggplant. And University of Hawaii researchers are working to genetically engineer a banana resistant to the bunchy top virus that is stunting trees across the globe. Biotechnology is an important plant breeding tool that supports food security and sustainable agriculture. Fire burn GMO. Fire burn Monsanto. We're coming for you. And we know you. We've got to not let this be the voice defining <clears throat> us. You want a better Hawaii for your kids? You want a better Hawaii for the future? We've got to unify. Because this is what's going to help the local people.